All right, folks, so these are the brand new Edge 540 and 840 from Garmin. The updates to the very long-standing Edge 530 and 830 that came out almost exactly three years ago. So last year, Garmin came out with their flagship Edge 1040 and 1040 Solar, and with the Edge 540 and the 840, they take basically everything that was introduced with the 1040 and packs it into a smaller form factor, like the solar charging option, a refreshed user interface, more training performance feedback features, as well as dual-band side license support. But along with all that, they are introducing some brand new things with the 540 and the 840, like a slightly different form factor than the previous generation 530 and 830. There's a huge new update to Garmin's Climb Pro feature that you definitely need to know about, and they've actually added more buttons to the 840, which does make things super interesting when choosing between these two devices. So Garmin's technically launching four new bike computers today. So there's the Edge 540, there's the Edge 540 Solar, there's the Edge 840, and then the 840 Solar. And the main difference between the 540 and the 840 is that the 540 uses an all button configuration without a touchscreen. And then the 840 adds a touchscreen along with the physical buttons. But a big departure here from the previous generation Edge 830, which only had three physical buttons along with the touchscreen, is that the 840, it now includes the exact same seven button configuration as the 540. So basically there's no compromise here with the 840 in terms of how you want to get around the device, which was actually a big reason some people actually preferred the 530 before. So with the 840, you can use a touchscreen whenever that's the most convenient for you, but you can use the buttons in situations where it's not as ideal to use the touchscreen, like if you have heavier gloves on or if your hands are sweaty. And for the rest of the features, for the most part, they're nearly identical between these two, where both of these come with a solar charging option. Both of these get dual band side light system support. Both of these get the big new Climb Pro enhancements. Both of these get Garmin's power guide feature for managing efforts during a ride. Both of them have Garmin's real-time stamina feature, and both of them get the revamped user interface that was originally launched with the Edge 1040. But there are a few differences between the new Edge 540 and the 840, other than the touchscreen, of course, where there is a difference in storage between these two, and there's also a few navigation-specific features that are only found on the 840, and we'll be covering all this in this video, along with how the 540 and the 840 actually performed with plenty of tests. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get to it. And the first thing we need to talk about, of course, is what comes inside the box. So with the 540 and the 840, the contents are the same on all four different options. So you get the computer itself, you get an out front mount, which is basically the same mount as before, but it has a few small aesthetic changes. It comes with adapters for the out front mount for different diameter handlebars, as well as allen wrenches to install the mount. It also comes with two sets of elastic quarter turn mounts. And these are nice to have because along with the out front mount, you'll have additional mounts if you have numerous bikes. It has a tether, it has manuals, and a USB-C charging cable. And yep, the 540 and the 840 do in fact use USB-C charging, at least to plug into the edges themselves, but the other end is a USB type A. And by the way, you do want to keep track of this specific USB-C cable they include because they're a bit different than some USB-C cables that just provide charging where these cables provide data transfer. So although pretty much all USB-C cables will charge the edges if you plug them into your computer, they may actually not show up in Garmin Express or as an external drive. But what is nice is that there's a nice Garmin logo on the cable so it's easier to keep track of. In terms of dimensions, the Edge 540 and the 840 are basically identical to each other and they're similar in height to the previous generation 830 and 530, but they are now a little bit wider wider than before, and the distance from the bottom of the quarter turn mount to the top of the display is nearly identical. And when it comes to weight, the Edge 540 non-solar comes in at 81.1 grams, and for comparison, the Edge 530 comes in at slightly less 77.2 grams, and then the Edge 840 solar comes in at 89.1 grams, and then the Edge 830 comes in at 79.8 grams. Oh, and I don't actually have an Edge 540 solar on me, but that weighs about 85 grams, so there's basically a few more grams if you're looking at the solar models. And then another small but actually quite significant change now is on the quarter turn mount. Now, quarter turn mounts are super convenient, but one thing that can happen with these mounts is that if you crash and hit your computer, there's actually a possibility of these little tabs breaking off. And so with the Edge 1040, they went ahead and made the quarter turn mount out of metal. So if you were to crash, it will most likely break the female portion of the mount that's made out of plastic versus the computer itself. Now the quarter turn mounts on the 540 and 840, these are still plastic. However, notice these two little screws right here. These are actually now replaceable if you were to break these off in a crash. And then you'll also notice here too with the 540 and the 840, there's these little gold pins on the bottom. So just like the 530 and 830, these are also compatible with Garmin Charge Power Pack. Oh, and really quick, if you're finding the information in this video useful, do me a favor and just quickly hit that like button down below. It's a small little thing that you can do that'll help this video and the channel quite a bit, and I appreciate it.
And then another difference between the 540 and the 840 is that the 540 comes with 16 gigabytes of storage, where the 840 comes with 32 gigabytes. So the 840 gets a bump in storage from the previous generations, where the 540 actually has the same capacity. Now, what is interesting about this, though, is that, well, the map data is actually much different and much larger on the 540 and the 840, and that's due to the new Climb Pro enhancements. And then more details about that interesting little tidbit in here in just one bit. And then when it comes to the buttons, they've definitely improved on these from the previous generation, where they're slightly more raised with a tall profile so it's easier to know if you're actually pressing a button and they're also a lot clickier and provide a lot more feedback than before where with the buttons on the 530 and the 830 well they sort of felt like soft marshmallows and that's definitely not the case with the 840 and 540 and then the bottom buttons also do have this very distinguishable edge on the inside corner where you'll definitely know if you're on it. And then when it comes to button placement, the buttons on the side are very similar to the previous generation Edge 530. So they're basically gonna be offset enough where you don't experience any double presses of both a button on the left and a button on the right when you're going to press one of the buttons, which I did find to happen on sometimes on the Edge 520. The buttons on the bottom though, these do have a slightly different placement where they're oriented a bit closer to the corners of the device than the 530 where they're more clearly on the bottom. And then in regards to the touchscreen, with the previous generation 830, you had a touchscreen along with the three button configuration. But now with the 840, it shares the exact same seven button configuration as the 540. And what this allows you to do is use the touchscreen when it's most convenient for you. And then you can use the buttons in situations where using a touchscreen isn't as ideal, like if it's raining out or if you have heavier gloves on. And in regards to touchscreen responsiveness, it's certainly very usable with lighter gloves on or the gloves that have the capacitive touch material built inside, which seems to basically be about the same as the 830, which is to say, I think it works pretty darn well in most situations. And then the same thing goes for rain or if your hands are wet, where it seems to handle that pretty well. But there just are some situations where you may want to use physical buttons, like if you have heavier gloves on, and this is where the mirroring of the same button configuration on the 540, you can just go ahead and use the entire interface on the 840 basically just like you would on the 540. And this really is a pretty big update in my mind, and I have to imagine that some of the inspiration for this came from their Phoenix 7 sports watch, where they added a touchscreen to that watch along with the tried and true buttons. But in doing so, they made it so you can use either the touchscreen or the buttons throughout the interface. And with the 840, it's kind of just the opposite approach where they added more buttons, but the same concept applies where they're basically giving you the choice depending on the situation. Now, this does bring up something though with the 540 versus the 840, and that's where the 840 is just easier to use than the 540 in a lot of situations, because you do have the choice of the touchscreen or the buttons. And I'm gonna loop back to this in a lot more detail when we talk about the user interface. And then in regards to the displays, other than the difference with the touchscreen component, the displays on the 840 and the 540 are the same size and resolution. And they're actually the same size as the previous generation 830 and 530, but the 840 and 540 don't appear to be quite as bright though as the previous generation. Not to say that the 840 and 540 are hard to read or anything like that, but at similar brightness levels, it seems like the 830 and 530 are just slightly brighter. And then another thing you may be curious about when it comes to readability and brightness is the solar option on each of these models. And they have what Garmin's called their power glass technology, which is basically a 15% efficient solar panel that lays on top of the display. And just like the power glass technology on their wearables, it does make a little bit of an impact when it comes to brightness, where without the power glass, it's just a little bit more clear. But again, though, I didn't have any issues with readability or brightness with the new 840 or the 540, but it's just some finer points I wanted to mention in case you were curious. When it comes to data pages and how many fields you can display on a data page at one time, the 540 and the 840 are the same as the 530 and 830, where you can have up to 10 data fields on a page at one time. And then another thing that comes down from the 1040 is that the 840 and the 540 get a revamped user interface, which I found to be a really nice improvement from the Edge 530, 830, as well as the 1030 series. So with the previous generation 830 and 530, when you first turned on the device, it displays the last activity profile you used, along with left and right arrows to scroll through different ride profiles, and then some options below those for navigation and training, as well as the main menu and some Connect IQ apps. But with the 840 and 540, just like the 1040, when you first turn on the device, it's more like a dashboard approach where you do have your last used ride profile up top along with those left and right arrows, but they've shrunk that area quite a bit where it makes room for a lot more information below. So now there's this scrollable area with all these different widgets for different bits of information like your daily suggested workout, there's a navigation widget, there's a location search feature, there's a training widget that shows your training calendar, your activity history, and do notice that it not only shows your cycling workouts, but other workouts as well Let's say if you have a Garmin watch, there's also notifications, weather information, and then there's a bunch of performance feedback related information like your training status, VO2 max, FTP, training load, recovery time, your cycling ability. And what this does is actually it analyzes your training history and classifies you as a particular rider style. There's event related widgets, like if you have an event coming up, your event calendar, and then even some more generalized metrics like your intensity minutes for the week, as well as your fitness age. 
And then below that, we also have a menu item, which is basically the same as the little hamburger menu. And that brings up basically more settings for different things like customizing activity profiles, managing external sensors, safety and tracking features, and system settings. And by the way, with the dashboard and all these widgets, you can customize these to your liking where you can have just the ones you want to appear and you can customize the order as well. But there is a big difference though when it comes to getting around the interface between the 540 and 840 where because there are just a lot of options and areas of the interface, it can take longer to get to different types of functions. And the biggest difference I probably noticed there are with the in-ride widgets where with the 840, all you have to do is just simply swipe down from the top and there's all your widgets like quick access to settings and plenty of other functions that you can just swipe through like you're swiping through Tinder profiles. But with the 540, you have to short press the upper right hand button which brings up an options menu. Then you have to scroll down to widgets and then only then can you scroll through them. And then the other area of the interface where having a touch screen makes a big difference is using maps, where with the 540, you have to short press the upper right hand button when you're on the map page to access the pan and zoom controls that you control with the left hand buttons, where with the 840, basically you can do nearly all of this with touch controls. And if you are used to the 530, it's probably not that big a departure, but it's definitely something I wanted to point out since I've used both of these devices for quite some time now. Now, other than the hardware, a huge new update to the 540 and the 840 is a big enhancement to Climb Pro. So first off, if you're not familiar with Climb Pro, well, it's probably one of my favorite Garmin features that's come out in recent times. So with Climb Pro, what it does is that when you load in a route, it's able to automatically look at that route and break out all the individual climbs on the ride. And what happens here is that when you approach one of the climbs, it automatically triggers a special climb Climb Pro data page, which first gives you a countdown to the climb, and then when the climb starts, it gives you plenty of information about the climb, such as a color-coded chart indicating different grades, your position on the climb, your current grade that you're climbing, as well as the distance remaining, as well as the ascent remaining. And this really has been such a useful feature for me where I've been able to manage my efforts on a climb, but it's also just nice to know just how much suffering is left on a particular climb. And although this is a really cool feature, this only worked if you loaded in a route. Well, until today. So Garmin has now added an automatic climb detection feature, or another term you may hear is free ride climbs, without having to load in a route at all. But they also have a few other things up their sleeve with this. So now when you're out on a ride and approach a climb, and again, whether you load in a route or not, up pops a very familiar data page to what we've seen before with Climb Pro, where it shows an elevation profile of the climb that it detected, your current position on that climb, as well as your current grade, the average remaining grade of the climb, the distance remaining on the climb, as well as the elevation remaining on the climb. And then it also shows a map up top with the climb highlighted with different colors indicating the classification of the climb. And what's interesting about these automatically detected climbs is that they're basically predicting your forward path and you'll see these climbs actually pop up well before the climb actually starts. So there's actually a bit of runway, I guess you could say, that's built into these pop-ups where it's not just the climb itself, but a good amount of distance even before the climb. And how they do this is basically a combination of elevation data that's included in the map data, along with predicting your forward movement or your trajectory. And this special data page just pops up regardless of whatever data page that you're currently on. But what is neat too is that if you're on the map page, the automatically detected climb will be highlighted with a color which indicates the grade of the climb and a climb classification if it has one. But what about a situation where there may be numerous options where the road could kind of split off depending on which direction you go? What happens there? Well, even though it is predicting your forward path, it also displays different options that you could take. So like here, the climb I'm currently on goes to the right, which is the main road, but it also shows a climb if I were to go off to the left. And then here's another example where it shows numerous climb options that go to the right. It's really cool. And with this automatic climb detection, there are certain parameters that it's looking for. So the climb needs to be at least a 3% grade for at least 500 meters for them to pop up. Now, this feature is just rolling out right now, and they will be tweaking this as they get more feedback. And one area where climbs may actually not pop up are on short, punchy climbs. And I did encounter this on just a handful of occasions with some mountain biking. And then they did also mention that right now, the automatic climb detection or the free ride climb pro feature is more tuned for road and gravel biking at the moment. But again, they'll certainly be optimizing this more and more in the future. Okay, so that's actually just the start of the new Climb Pro enhancements, but there's even more to talk about here. So now in the widget list, there's this new Climb Explore widget. And what this does is that it brings up climbs that is detected that are close to your current location. Now, the big difference here though, is that these climbs in the Climb Explore widget, they actually have a higher threshold than the automatically detected climbs that we just talked about. And although this sort of makes things a little confusing, there's actually really good reason for this. So with all these climbs in the Climb Explore widget, these are climbs that have a minimum threshold of 3.5% versus the 3% of the automatically detected climbs. And Garmin basically said that the reason for this is that they want these climbs to be ones that you really want to go and seek out, I guess you could say, versus just stumbling upon like automatically detected climbs. And you can see the concept here of seeking out these climbs because all these climbs are listed out based on your current location with the distance to that climb, along with the direction, the average grade of that climb, as well as the distance of the climb itself. 
And all you do is just basically simply tap on one of these and up pops the elevation profile of that climb, the details of that climb, as well as a map showing where that climb is with the climb highlighted. And what you do when you've chosen your level of suffering is you just tap on the right and automatically calculates the best route to get there. And what you can also do is filter these climbs that are listed based on a search radius, minimum and maximum difficulty in regards to the grade, the type of terrain, and how they're actually sorted. And what's interesting too here is that all these climb explorer climbs are also shown on the map with these new mountain icons. And all you have to do here is just orient the map so the red pin is over the icon and up top it shows that there's a climb. And then just go ahead and tap on that. It shows the details of the climb, just like the climb explorer widget. And then you can just click on ride to get there. But I again wanted to loop back to the usability differences between the 540 and the 840, especially with this feature. So with the 840, all you have to do to search for these climbs on the map is just pan around the map using the touchscreen, align the red pin with the climb, and then just tap on climb details. But with the 540, you do have to use the button controls to align the pin, which does take a little bit more time and is just a little bit less convenient. And another thing to note here is that the climbs that are on the map as well as the Climb Explore widget, well basically these have the same threshold as what you would get with normal Climb Pro when you're loading a route. So basically the climbs that are broken out with Climb Pro when you load in a route in theory should match what you should see on the map if you didn't load in a route at all. Hope that makes sense. Oh, and I also wanted to loop back to storage. So with all these new Climb Pro features, there's actually additional climb data that's built into the map data and the files are actually much larger than before. So here's a list of map data for the Edge 830 for North America on the left. And then here's the map data for the Edge 840 on the right. So it may be trickier to load in more than one region at one time on the 840, even with 32 gigabytes of storage and even more limited on the 540 since it only has 16 gigabytes. And I also wanted to bring up that Hammerhead with their Career 2 has had this free ride climb functionality or automatic detected climbs for a while now so Garmin is catching up in that regard but Garmin really has taken a huge step further with the climb explore feature as well as the climbs being shown on the map and by the way the enhanced climb pro features like the automatic climb detection or free ride feature without a route climb explore as well as the climb shown on the map those are coming to the 1040 but they won't be backported to the 830 and 530. And then the Edge 540 and the 840 also get some new training features that were originally launched with the Edge 1040. And the first one we can talk about is Power Guide. So what Power Guide aims to do is basically create a power strategy based on a route to help you better manage your efforts during a ride where you'll set up a bunch of parameters for your Power Guide strategy in Garmin Connect, including your bike weight, your riding position, as well as the route that you wanna take. And then you can fine tune that strategy based on your desired power output or your estimated finish time. And then another feature that the 540 and 840 get that originally came on the 1040 is Garmin's real-time stamina feature. So with real-time stamina, you can basically think of this as something like a gas tank gauge for how much total energy you have for your workout, but also how hard efforts like sprints take an effect during your workout. So what you have on the real-time stamina data page are a few fields, and we'll actually start from the bottom to the top, as I think it's a little bit easier to explain this way. So at the bottom, you have a heart rate graph. Above that, you have your power graph. And then above that, we have a field on the left called your stamina, and then the field on the right, that's called potential. Now, you can think of potential as your total gas tank, or another way to think about it is your long-term energy, and that's reflected with the estimated time at the top where, at this point in my workout, it says if I'm consistently maintaining this sort of pace or power, I could go for about five and a half hours before being completely depleted. But on the left of the potential, we have stamina, and how you can think of stamina is how much energy you have for short-term bursts. So what happens here is that when I quickly start to increase power, my short-term energy or stamina starts to decrease quickly. So with stamina, it's trying to basically give you an idea of how much energy you have or are using for those really hard but shorter efforts. And what you also notice too is that up top, my total estimated time starts to plummet because there's no way I could keep up that level of effort for that long. But what you can see here is that as I let up and recover, my stamina starts to increase as well as my total estimated time that it thinks I have left in the tank. And then eventually my stamina and potential should become in line with enough recovery. And with real-time stamina, as well as the power guide strategies, these are available on both the 540 as well as the 840. But the 840 actually does have a few features that the 540 doesn't have. And the reason for this is that these features would be kind of challenging to use without a touchscreen. And these include some navigation search features. There's an on-device course creation feature, as well as a workout creation feature. And then something else new to come with both the 840 as well as the 540 is a solar charging option. And this basically brings the solar charging technology that they originally launched with the 1040 solar to its new siblings. So what we have here now on the 840 solar as well as the 540 solar are these 100% efficient solar voltaic cells that surround the display. But in addition to that, it also has a layer of what Garmin calls their power glass technology, which sits atop the display, which is 15% efficient. And all that adds up to basically increasing battery life for up to 32 hours of battery life with the highest accuracy settings, and then up to 
use 60 hours in battery saver mode. But even without solar charging, any of the new Edge 540s or 840s have an advertised battery life of up to 26 hours using the highest accuracy settings and then up to 42 hours in the battery saver mode. And in regards to how well that solar charging actually works, well, on this ride, the 840 Solar actually nailed that 32 hour claim and this was a fairly sunny ride that day. And another thing that you can do with the solar charging is that you can actually place it in the sun when you're not using it for offline charging, but it really will come down to how much sun that you get. So on this test, it was a pretty cloudy and overcast day, and with just about a 55% intensity, it gained about 2% over the course of a few hours. So with the new 540 and 840, these come with a new dual band or multi-band satellite chipset. And with this kind of technology, the 540 and 840 can access two different satellite frequencies at the same time. And the aim with this sort of technology is to deliver better GPS accuracy in challenging situations where satellite signals can kind of get iffy, like if you're riding along in steep canyons and also can be very useful with mountain biking where there can be a lot of heavy tree cover as well as switchbacks where you may see less accuracy with devices without this sort of technology. And in regards to how accurate they actually are, so let's go ahead and start out with this gravel ride here. So here's where we can see that the 840 was right in line with all the other test devices I was using. Oh, and I didn't have the 540 on this ride, but don't worry, I have plenty of examples for you here in just one second. And then when it comes to the elevation gain, there actually was a little bit of variance here, at least from the Edge 830, where the other devices as well as the corrected elevation figure in Strava were a bit closer. And then when it comes to the finer detail of the GPS tracks, the Edge 840 did really well here. Quite good over the course of the entire ride where it held straight line sections really nice and solid and it was super crispy on all the corners. And really the only thing you may notice is that with the Edge 830 that's in light blue, it isn't quite as good on some of the corners, but I think that's about to be expected with a non-dual band satellite chipset. And then here's a little bit more interesting road ride here with both the 840 as well as the 540. And we can see here that the total distances lined up nearly perfectly between the, all the devices and so did the elevation gain, really good. What makes this ride sort of interesting though is that this was basically an out and back ride along nearly the exact same roads. And what we can see here is that the 540 and 840 as well as the other devices were very good at distinguishing one side of the road to the other. And then as we move up to the canyon portion of this ride, this is where satellite signals can get impaired. And again, the 540 and 840 did really well here. And then for an example for mountain biking, again, no issues here. And in fact, very close between all the devices and same thing goes for elevation. And then for the finer details of the GPS tracks on this ride, as I climbed up the trail here, most of the devices were pretty good to go, but the Element Volt V2 veered off just a hair. Nothing crazy by any means, but not quite on the trail like the others. And then up here, I basically did this loop three times, so we should hopefully see some nice solid tracks out of all of them. And that's pretty much the case again with some minor deviations from the Element Bolt. Again, nothing crazy by any means. And at the end of the day, the total distances lined up nicely. And with all that, let's now go ahead and talk about price. So the 540 non-solar runs $349 and then the non-solar 840 runs 449. So basically $100 more for the touchscreen. And then if you want solar, basically tack on another $100 on top of each of these. So the 540 solar is 449 and the 840 solar is 549. The need for solar charging will obviously depend on just how much battery life you really need and if you can benefit from those solar charging capabilities. But when it comes to the decision of a touchscreen or not, $100 is definitely not a small amount of money, but having used both of these devices side by side for a while now, I really would encourage you to consider spending that extra $100 for the 840, whether you choose solar or not. It just really is a lot easier to use, and I found myself just trying to touch the screen on the 540 on a lot of occasions. And this very well could just be my brain just getting too used to the convenience of the touchscreen on the 840, but again, just the fact that you do have the same exact button configuration on the 840 now as what's found on the 540, it's truly a case of just kind of having your cake and eating it too with the 840. Anyhow, that's everything new with the new Edge 840 and 540. And if you have any questions about anything I didn't cover in this video, make sure to leave those in the comment section down below. And on your way down there, if you found the information in this video useful, do me a favor and also hit that like button. And also subscribe to the channel for plenty more sports tech videos that are right around the corner. In the meantime, happy riding and we will see you in the next video.